The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to the Into the Impossible podcast, a production of UC San Diego's Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. And it's a real treat to have one of my uh, heroes, my heroines, however you want to say it, uh, in physics. And not only a physicist, we have a lot of physicists on this show, but an experimental physicist. And you may be one of the first, if not the first, honest-to-goodness experimentalist uh, who has come on this program. So thank you, Elena. It's a real treat to have you here. Such nice words, yes. Yeah, so that make me happy. <laughs> I'm glad. You make a lot of people happy. To think by about me as a woman and an experimentalist. Yes, yes it's I like true. to do things with my own hands. Yes, absolutely. And it's wonderful to have you here. I want to give a brief introduction for the few people out there who may not know you. Uh, you were born next week in a time uh, that I won't mention. <laughs> but uh, your birthday is March 12th, which is, uh, which is only two days before Einstein's birthday. So that's ah. wonderful. And unfortunately, Stephen Hawking's date of being deceased was March 14th, I believe. And she is an Italian-American particle physicist. She's been a professor at Columbia University since 1986. She's the founder and spokesperson of the Xenon Dark Matter Experiment, which is a major component of our conversation today. Uh, she's known for her work with noble gas, uh, noble liquid detectors, and her contributions to particle astrophysics, in the particular the search for dark matter, which was a subject of your visit uh, or your talk that you gave to the public as part of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, we screened a film that you're in. So you're not only a, a wonderfully accomplished physicist, a professor at a top Ivy League university, but you're also a movie star. And uh, <laughs> I think, you know, I mentioned to you earlier, my wife thought I was interviewing Sophia Loren when I she see. saw the film last night. But um, I do want to just mention your brief background. You were a student in the University of Naples. You were at Harvard. Um, in the 80s, working as a postdoctoral researcher for Carlo Rubia's group, uh, who's a well-known Nobel laureate, and the subject of a book called Nobel Dreams. And I'm not sure if you make a cameo in that book. You may, you may not. I forgot. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm crying liquid argon tears in that, <laughs> in that book. It's right. true. <laughs> uh, so she's had so many awards, uh, but though I'll focus on one of them. She's an uh, NSF Career Award. Uh, she received the Medal Official della Repubblica <laughs> Italiana from the Italian president, Carlo Agazzi. Azzelio. Azzelio Campi. 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 Uh, she has an asteroid named after her, so that is a type of dark matter which is named after you. I it's asteroid uh, 268686 Elena April. No way. Yeah, discovered by Italian uh, amateur astronomer Silvano Casuli in 2006. How do you know that? I know it. <laughs> Check Wikipedia, folks. Oh, gosh. Uh, she received the uh, Lancelot and Berkeley New York Community Trust Prize for meritorious work in astronomy from the American Astronomical Society. And she is uh, gracing us this quarter mm. at UC San Diego as one of our Margaret Burbage visiting professors. So welcome again. I want to talk about, right now, I want to talk about Margaret Burbage because uh, the uh, visiting professorship uh, that you hold currently uh, in honor uh, is named in honor of my colleague Margaret Burbage, who is a hundred years young, <laughs> and she lives up in the Bay Area of California. Uh, but she is uh, one of the founding members of the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences, where we found ourselves today. And among many of her distinctions, ranging from uh, the uh, not the Royal Astronomer, there's some uh, controversy about that, but she was the uh, astronomer uh, who led the Greenwich Observatory. She was president, I believe, of the American Astronomical Society, many, many things. Mm. She was one of the leaders and founders of this uh, center that we're in now. But she also, um, among her many honors, she uh, trained in some sense and befriended a young astronomer by the name of Vera Rubin. And, of course, Vera Rubin is well known as being credited with finding some of the most convincing evidence for the existence of dark matter. So I wanted to just uh, highlight that fact that UCSD has this deep connection through Margaret Burbage and Jeff Burbage, her, uh, her husband. The two of them were very close with Vera Rubin and her husband. And when she did a sabbatical here in the 60s, uh, that's when uh, she learned a lot about the type of spectroscopic studies that she could later use to measure rotation curves of these distant galaxies and really provide... Uh, some convincing evidence for the existence of dark, dark matter. Uh, so I want to ask you first, um, 
what is it about dark matter? Why, why does it uh, transfix the imagination? Is it the name? Is it this mysterious uh, properties that it has of seeming non-interactivity? Because uh, I know a lot of people who don't like to interact are very introverted, but <laughs> dark matter seems to be quite introverted in a sense. What fascinates people? And maybe I'll ask you, what, what interests you the most about dark matter? I think simply is because if you think that we, we, I mean, the stuff that we know makes such a little amount in this universe, it's just, how can you not think about finding out what the rest is? So I don't know if the name is correct, this dark matter. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we inherited it from Swiki, right? But, um, yeah, what is it about it? I think we have to do it. I mean, uh, there is no other way. I mean, it's so important because... Mm-hmm. When you tell your children or your friends, I mean, what are you doing? You're studying dark matter. And, and the way I usually present it is that we're trying to find out what the 95% mm-hmm. of the universe is made of. And they say, what do you mean, what the 95% of the universe is made of? Because, I mean, for normal people, this is an intriguing question. But for us, it's much more intriguing because the connection about dark matter and what it is and particle physics and what we learned all this life about the building blocks of nature and the fundamental laws of physics all that can change Mm. once we find out what this dark matter is so Mm -hmm. it's the connection for me is the connection with astrophysics astronomy cosmology particle physics Mm -hmm. which actually is the most appealing Mm -hmm. i i cannot think of another topic today which unifies all these dis- disciplines right and i guess you know some of the question uh that that naturally comes up is is dark matter a new type of material is right. it actually matter or could it somehow be you know a placeholder for some ignorance that we might have about how gravity works can you say something about whether or not this is still a deep controversy within your field i don't i wouldn't say it's a deep controversy but we have had mon modified uh, gravity theories mm-hmm. and uh, we have more recently heard about this uh, a new theory of uh, gravity from uh, our friend Eric Ferlinde so it's not a controversy but there are people out there who might and I don't know if they're correct we don't know uh, it's it's plausible but any new theory would have to explain all the phenomena that we see and observe and mm-hmm. as far as I know to date None of this theory that some of these people have put forward are able to explain fully the observations that we have mm-hmm. at all scales. So yes. until then, uh, I'm just keep looking. The, there's sort of a thorny issue that I've thought about a lot, which is how do you know when to stop doing an experiment? When we teach our undergraduates, there's a known answer that they're trying to get. And they stop when they get something that's reasonably close to that answer or, you know, could conceivably convince their uh, their TA that they're on the right track. Um, but before we get to how do you turn off an experiment, which I think is an interesting question in the context of, um, of pursuits where there may not be an answer. We may never detect gravitational wave B modes in the CMB, for example. Uh, maybe it will be impossible to detect dark matter. Who knows? But we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But before that, I want to talk about how do you decide to start an experiment what gave you the uh, chutzpah as as we say the gumption the gall if you will to start this incredibly ambitious uh, many tens of millions of dollars experiment that you've raised with your collaborators and and what gives you the notion that it's time to pursue something and start off on something that could be a 20 30 40 year quest well, that's easy to answer because when I started, which is more than 15 years ago, the field was so way back different than now. Mm-hmm. The situation was quite easy in a sense because we have had uh, we had had few detectors, few technologies, very very mm-hmm. powerful, but <coughs> small scale detectors, and they were searching specifically for this hypothetical candidate for dark matter, which we call the weakly interacting massive particle. So designed specifically for that, to measure the tiny energy that would be released in a material if this hypothetical particle would care to scatter off an atom of that material. Mm -hmm. And so we were talking about these beautiful cryogenic bolometers at that time, and they had explored a little region of this so-called parameter space, namely the interaction strength of a WIMP with a nucleon. 
And at that time, these technologies, the scaling up of those technology was already clear then that it was very painful, mm -hmm. costly, and technically, technologically very challenging. So I happened to attend a meeting, at the Snowmass meeting in Colorado, I think it was, mm -hmm. and I listened to a lot of these dark matter talks and saw the picture of the status of, of the art at that time, and I connected quickly to the development that I was doing for NASA for gamma-ray astrophysics. I had been developing these liquid xenon detectors for detecting the radiation, the nucleosynthesis from supernova, from nova. Mm -hmm. And so I decided, or I thought that it's my, my detector would be actually better and more scalable than this technology of the time. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got the idea of proposing the Xenon experiment. Mm -hmm. So, and if I'm not mistaken, you have a patent related to that gamma ray astronomical. Yeah, art, that was with is... one of my graduate students. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a light detecting device. We did a lot of work in the lab with these noble liquefied gases, and mm -hmm. so then I settled on to liquid xenon, and a lot of the work was done for, as I said, as a Compton telescope, to use it mm -hmm. in a Compton telescope for imaging gamma rays. Mm -hmm from, let's say, nucleosynthesis in stars. And what is xenon? How does it compare to, say, helium, which you can go down to the supermarket and buy a balloon full of? What is, what is liquid yeah, xenon? Yeah, I know, and, and is... you like helium. Yeah. I know you do. But, <laughs> but uh, we have had hard time to, to detect uh, electrons in helium mm -hmm. or to actually see scintillation from it. So the advantage of xenon and all these rare gases is that it is the most amazing in terms of when you cool it down, when you liquefy it in terms of ionizer and scintillator, so it gives mm -hmm. you the highest yield, the largest number of photons per unit energy, of free electron per unit energy, that gives you signals that mm -hmm. you want to have available to detect some radiation. So mm -hmm. it's a great radiation detection medium. Mm -hmm. It is, in addition, um, very easy. I mean, with time, after 15 years now, we learned how to make it clean. Mm -hmm to remove electronegative impurities, stuff oxygen-like, which eat easily electrons, and mm -hmm. if you lose the signal, you know. We're talking about a handful of electrons when we talk about <laughs> detecting <laughs> the energy of a dark matter right. particle interaction. So even few electrons lost is detrimental, so mm -hmm. we need to keep this material clean. We learned how to do it. The other advantage compared to, let's say, argon or helium is that when you liquefy, the temperature is relatively warm. Mm -hmm. So, as I say sometimes, easy cryogenics compared, let's say, to what you're used to. Right. So, we have invented cryocoolers, pulse tube refrigerators, which can keep this xenon. In my lab, we used to be in small detector size, we used to use nitrogen. Mm -hmm. and alcohol and make a molasses, I would steer with the wooden no. stick. <laughs> so it's hard to keep a detector for years and years if you want to steer <laughs> the to. thing. So mechanical coolers have come very handy and mm -hmm. we have made a lot of progress on that for that specific liquid xenon temperature. Mm -hmm. Let's say minus 100 degree or so C mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because most of the cryo coolers you find on the market are optimized for liquid nitrogen. Mm -hmm typically. Right. So for liquid xenon, we had to develop with a company in Japan a specific cooler, pulse refrigerator. Uh -huh. So it's very good ionizer, scintillator. Uh, you can keep it clean. You And then for dark matter or rare mm -hmm. searches, another great advantage or requirement that you have is that there are no intrinsic radioactivities mm. because you're searching for a very rare event. Mm -hmm. If you have the example is the argon. Liquid argon is also a very good candidate for dark matter mm -hmm. as target and detector medium. Mm -hmm. But you have the big problem of the argon-39 mm -hmm. intrinsic radioactivity, which gives mm -hmm. you a becquerel of rate. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, we have solved that as well today because we are trying to extract this argon from wells mm -hmm. and remove this intrinsic radioactivity. In Xenon, you don't have intrinsic radioactivities other than maybe the krypton, traces of krypton. Mm -hmm. And we have learned again with time how to distill. We say distill, mm -hmm. yes, cryogenic distillation mm -hmm. is being used a lot. We have huge distillation column on the Xenon setup mm -hmm. to remove the krypton, let's say, yeah. because krypton has this tiny amount of krypton-85, which is radioactive. Radioactive as well, right. So all mm -hmm. these things make it, and also I think, coming back to helium, you have to see also where most of the work went. Yeah. You know, 
because still today in my lab, in many other labs, we are learning about the fundamental physics, the microphysics. Sometimes we say, oh, this liquid. We still have a lot of things we don't understand. The recombination process, because mm -hmm. the mechanisms through which these light and charges are produced in these materials are quite complex. Mm -hmm. There are interplay between applying an electric field to keep the free electrons separate from the parent ion, uh, stuff which eats the scintillation and mm -hmm. the excimers which are forms and go to ground state giving you light uh, can be formed also through the recombination process. So it's a very complicated physics and also physics that we had to learn to find out very low energies. Right. Because the work I did with NASA, within the NASA framework side, of right? thing was MEV energies, mm -hmm. the famous 511 kV mm -hmm. line. And now you're asking, what is the energy that Dark a, a nuclear recoil from a WIMP interaction gives you? Right. And this is few kV. And so the first question I had when we started Xenon was, how many electrons do you expect from a kV mm -hmm. of a nuclear recoil? recoil right which I didn't know because I was dealing with gamma rays, alpha <laughs> particle, what is a nuclear recoil? Right. So we started to make experiments with neutrons in the lab mm. to mm -hmm. produce neutron, a nuclear recoil from neutron scattering on mm -hmm. xenon and measuring the yield, how many charges, how many photons you find in right. these detectors in order, essential question to, to calibrate. calibrate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and we still haven't finished this quest because mm -hmm. of course we want to go lower and lower in energy. Right. More resolution. And so on mm -hmm. and so forth. But as an example, I bring always my proposal, the Zenon proposal at a threshold, I don't remember, 10 or 20 kV as an energy wow. threshold. Mm -hmm. When we first did the first prototype, even Xenon 10, mm. we could show that the energy threshold was much, was much lower than that. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that we had no idea that we could go so low. I mean, nobody knew really how low in threshold. But now you know these detectors can be a single photon sensitive, single electron sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So that's something you learn with time. So the current limits that, that you have, um, have achieved with Xenon um, uh, are really the, are the most competitive in the world, I would say. Mm -hmm. Although we, we should say, and maybe I'm curious, because I, I can't resist. I have an expert, and an Italian expert, no less. Um, what do you think about this Dama excess that's mm -hmm. been going on since I was a <laughs> graduate student? Uh, that seems to say that suggests that there is not only a dark matter uh, existing particle, but it it behaves exactly as you'd expect from the sort of distribution of dark matter particles in our galaxy, and the relative increase or decrease is sort of a wind and running into the wind and out of the wind as the Earth or orbits around the sun uh, each year. Uh, and, and, and getting the so-called annual modulation. So mm. this is a many, many sigma. I forget how many it is by now, but the claim is that... It's 12 or more. 12 yeah, or we more, had a talk a right. few weeks ago again mm -hmm. at this conference. So you're the, the world's talk. expert. Yeah, so tell me, what do you... Yeah, when mm. I was a grad student, it was five sigma. They something. have increased their significance of this modulation. They clearly see a beautiful signal, which mm -hmm. modulates with the right phase. <coughs> and... It's just it just remains as of today unclear what the hell is doing that, because if that were coming from the vanilla wimp hypothesis, mm -hmm. the same wimps that we're looking for in these detectors and many others, based on that rate on that amplitude, we would have to see a huge signal which we haven't seen, mm -hmm. and so the only way to answer that question, modulation is indeed the most direct and beautiful way of discovering a wimp. And so for that, we have actually made a search with our own Xenon data, Xenon 100 data, to search for animodulation and test for leptophilic models and whatever. We still don't find anything. So the question is, why is it so special, sodium iodide, which is the target that this experiment uses? And after so many years since I started myself, yeah, we have finally come to the point where we have other experiments using that same technology, mm -hmm. testing the DAMA mm -hmm. signal. Unfortunately, these experiments as of today, they haven't reached the sensitivity or the statistics good enough mm -hmm. to say mm -hmm. yes or no. So they keep taking data and I'm waiting. We don't find the signals in Xenon. We don't find it in other detectors. So it remains a mystery. Mm -hmm. And so we don't go there, they insist, but mm -hmm. 
If I were the Dharma people, I would have taken my detector and moved it somewhere else. Yeah, or give it to somebody else to right. take some data and yeah. analyze the data. My but understanding is they're a little they're bit They're very more stubborn on keeping them. Yeah. We so is it natural not to be stubborn? One of the things that, that, um, that was so resonant with me uh, in the film Chasing Einstein, which is mm -hmm. your um, one of your debut, it's probably your debut in the on the big screen and a wonderful documentary, which is available for people to purchase online, iTunes, YouTube, etc. Um, and they cut to you uh, and they uh, show you, you know, along with some. I guess you're listening to Shakira in the background, no. very elegant, very. Uh, and they <laughs> and they show you, and then they show you going into the lab, and you're mm. in the lab, you're with your students, you're clearly at home. Morning. Hello. The wiring was you. I was screaming at the other girl, the other student. But you left it around. <laughs> and you say a lovely thing, which, uh, you know, again, resonated with me very strongly. And you say, this is my baby. This is my baby. This is my baby. And I love it every time I come in here. My students, you know, sometimes I shout. I scream and shout, really. I hate to see those cable ties left hanging, and I'm sure you find some. If your cable tie is hanging, it means in your house you also. And who is going to want to have a guy like you? So I keep telling them, you have a better chance to find a woman. Zinu Anton has been operating for more than one and a half year now, so we're very close to open that box and, um, and see what, what nature is for us. You want to be confident and excited and hopeful that maybe this time is the time and you will see a sign of dark matter. It, it spoke to me in that this sort of personification or anthropomorphizing your experiment, uh, it, which, is, which is something, you know, we all bleed, cry, and sweat on our experiments. And I, I don't think the average, you know, layperson appreciates just how hard it is to do these results, especially given the fact that we seem to come up, you know, at least from some perspectives, of null detections, of no no positive results. We have not yet detected, as I said, convincing evidence for, you know, inflationary origin of the universe, if you will. We may never, um, and it may, be, it may be that inflation did take place, but we don't have the sensitivity and never will. Uh, or it could be that inflation didn't take place and there might be some other alternatives. How do you continue to persist in the, in the face of this? So the Dhamma folks clearly feel they have um, something to prove to the community and that they are not being uh, accepted at face value. Uh, I don't know of any other field where such a large uh, statistical significance would be dismissed, but let's, yeah. So where, where do, where do you get your, yeah. When do we get as experimentalists? When do we realize it's time to wrap up? When I started, the field was a certain mm -hmm. stage and it made a lot of sense right. to jump in. And in fact, the major achievement that I feel I've made with my collaboration and experiment is really to explore not one, not two, but four or five orders of magnitude from where we were then, mm -hmm. in terms of testing the interaction strength of WIMPs with matter, you know, excluding cross sections, which are lower, lower, and lower. Four or five orders of magnitude in about 10 years, yeah. 12 years. This is a major deal in yeah. this in this and any other field. Well, it's huge swaths of And now space. we are getting to the point where we are making these detectors more and more sensitive, larger and larger. Mm -hmm. There were the scalability vision that one had, everybody knew, but I mean, you have this noble liquid, you can make them larger. We're mm -hmm. talking about not few hundred, few tens of a kilogram. We're talking now about 8,000 kilogram. Yeah. 10,000 kilogram of target, mm -hmm. which has never been done. Right. And with that kind of step, now we want to seize the last little bit of this so-called theoretical prediction. We are basing our detector. The detectors have been designed specifically for a, a particle candidate, which is called the WIMP. Mm -hmm. So all these detectors have been designed specifically to search for mostly massive WIMPs. Mm -hmm. Search has been done mostly for tens of GV, hundreds of GV, up to the TV scale, massive WIMPs for which this target, specifically xenon, is very, very good because it has a lot of nucleons. The xenon mm -hmm. atom is very large, yeah. and if a WIMP scatters off a nucleus, it likes to scatter with all the nucleus, nucleons coherently. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the larger the 
the nucleus you have, the better you are off in the spin independent so called way. So now we reach the point where we're going to exclude maybe just one order of magnitude. We, we are separated from a level of background that we can't avoid, despite all our smart, <laughs> which is the neutrinos. neutrino background. And so neutrinos from the sun, from the atmospheric neutrino, supernova. the supernova neutrino are going to give us a signal soon. Mm -hmm. But we have that last one order of magnitude, maybe two orders of magnitude, separating us from the signal of mm -hmm. neutrinos. And so I think at that point you have to stop in the sense that you turn your detector into a beautiful neutrino detector, but there are many others. So the, the natural stopping time is coming mm -hmm. to, the, to the time when the neutrino signal is going really to make it impossible for you to find a signal from WIMP if it is so at the level of neutrino. Mm -hmm. so the, but we still have a way to go because with the current generation of experiment which is about to start, the xenon and ton, we're going to go still an order of magnitude above the neutrino floor almost. Mm -hmm. And then if we're still finding nothing, there is a little bit more and a lot of pain to get there because yeah. it's amazing how you scale them up, but you gain very, very little. Yeah, exponentially small. And then at a certain point you have to stop because, I mean, it, you can't even distinguish these particles if they exist mm -hmm. from the more known expected particles such as neutrinos. Mm -hmm. So we do know when we will stop. Mm -hmm. I will stop then. Yeah. Maybe... <laughs> But maybe I'm still hopeful that in the next round, which still is going to last four or five years from now, mm -hmm. of search, searching, searching for about good. another four or five years. So this decade for me is going to be critical mm -hmm. because we are going to start to search, uh, uh, competing, yeah, alternative experiment with the same technology starting, and we are mm -hmm. competing to start at the same time. Mm -hmm. We might have, we will have a liquid argon as well experiment starting this mm -hmm. decade. The LHC is starting again after mm -hmm. this shutdown. Uh, we have indirect detection with these beautiful telescopes from Ice Cube. So the Fermi is still out there, and we have the AMS out mm -hmm. there. So again, we said that last decade, actually. Yeah, exactly. I know, we keep saying the same thing, <laughs> but, same us, yeah. but we are going more and more down. Right. So in terms of theoretical framework, mm -hmm. I mean, of course, our friends theorists are so smart. They'll keep coming up with alternative. Right. And you know very well already the absence of a signal in all these channels yeah. from direct detection, indirect, direct, has prompted a wealth of searches in other, in neighboring energy regions. So mm -hmm. low mass WIMP mm -hmm. searches with accelerator, with beautiful little technologies because the cross section shoots up at low mass so you don't need such large detectors. And right. we have a lot of effort going on mm -hmm. at low mass. And so eventually this decade again, at least from the direct detection, which is the most, in my opinion, direct way of finding this particle in the, from the halo of this galaxy, should be concluded. Because mm -hmm. if we still don't find it this decade, there will be very little separating us from the neutrinos. Okay, well, in March of 2030, you and I are going to be back here, and I'm going to hold you to that. And we will talk about how beautiful the neutrino <laughs> the signal <next> is. <laughs> <laughs> or the oh, dark matter the, signal. Oh, the dark matter signal. So, uh, so uh, I mentioned that I have a favorite quote. Uh, it comes from Oscar Wilde. He quotes uh, in a book, or uh, his writing, Lady Windmere's fan. He, uh, he has a character, Lord Darlington Quip, the definition of a cynic is a man who knows the price of everything, but the value of nothing. And I think uh, it's sometimes hard to convince people, you know, when they ask me what I'm looking for and I say mostly nothing or <laughs> static or, or whatever. Noise. Uh, noise. Yeah. We spend all our days looking at noise and trying to get rid oh, of understanding noise. noise. Trying to understand it and model it, etc. Reduce uh, it. Uh -huh. I think that's one of the popular misconceptions <laughs> of scientists. First of all, they think we all have beards and we, we are rubbing our beards. And uh, and that's obviously not true in, in, in either one of our cases. <laughs> uh, but I think there is this sort of impression that, um, you know, it's only scientists science if you make a discovery in other words sort of positivist you you have to actually have something clear rather than ruling things out in the film uh, there's a young uh, a physicist postdoc who says you know every paper should be celebrated like a triumph like yeah, a victory yeah he, he, he was a great it was a great quote yeah. So, yeah and i and i think there there is some value in that um, i think there is this tendency to look at people like einstein 
you know, who is the film uh, namesake character in Chasing Einstein. And, you know, kind of hold him up to this level of authority and sort of almost like a halo effect that you know, nothing that he did could could possibly have failed and been wrong. And in fact, as we know, he made many, many blunders. And some say he made more blunders than non, than, than actual successes. I don't know if I agree with that. I think he, as I always say, he could have had a good career if he didn't. Uh, but, but you know, a lot of what comes up in physics is, is serendipitous and we don't expect it. Uh, the discovery of the cosmic microwave background, the CMB that I study, was completely serendipitous. Yeah, that's a beautiful. One. The discovery Example. of the of the acceleration of the universe of dark energy that was also serendipitous. They were looking for exactly the opposite, mm. and I wonder, you know, if by focusing, maybe this is just too philosophical to get into, but uh, discoveries of you know your your countryman Galileo Galilei, he he discovered things completely by accident and then applied scientific you know principles and the, and the scientific method towards sussing out all the details of that new field that he had basically single-handedly invented by virtue of this exquisite technology that he pioneered and i see similarities with you 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 pioneer this tool you've vacuumed up all of this parameter space mm -hmm. and that's sort of a natural thing to do um but i worry you know i wonder sometimes if uh what's driving us galileo never really released the plans for his telescope so that even his friend kepler could reproduce it mm -hmm. because he wanted to keep making these low-hanging fruit discoveries mm -hmm. himself and i wonder you know is that driven by this competition uh, as you know my my book i focus a lot on competition and whether or not what role the nobel prize plays in fact in the film you open in your office i guess i haven't been there yet i hope to someday visit you in your office but but with a poster of marie curie mm -hmm. And you talk, the first thing that comes out is about the Nobel Prize and how she won two. And I wonder, uh, is that a motivation for you? I know your, your advisor won a Nobel Prize, and, and obviously it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very um, dominant theme overarching both of our fields. Um, does, it play, does it play a role in you uh, personally? Is it something that influences you personally? I have to say no, to be honest. We are embedded in this idea that, of course, that's the highest honor you can get, and it would be absolutely great, it's true, but it never played a role, I have to say, because actually I see that when people get the Nobel Prize directly, I had two good friends, from Rubia to mm -hmm. George Harpeck. Mm -hmm. I was very close to these two great scientists, but they change completely. They get mm -hmm. completely... <clears throat> Paranoid and crazy. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, they so say, uh, I don't Nobel, like it. I think T.S. Eliot said the Nobel Prize is a ticket to your funeral because you never do anything good after you win. <laughs> I don't know. So I, I don't look forward to that. But of course, <laughs> the statement I made about Madame Curie was very natural because, well, she's known or she is the first woman and yeah. the one who got it twice. So, mm -hmm. but such different times. And yeah. I wonder, I don't know how she behaved after. Probably she was still normal. Yeah. I am more proud about seeing Madame Curie more in reading some of her biographies yeah. about the real woman. Yeah. Uh, because we tend to forget that the scientists like you and me have a life. Yeah. Let's talk about that. In particular, <laughs> you know, both of us are parents of daughters yeah. and uh and and i know uh that you know that in addition to uh to margaret burbage and vera rubin spending some time here uh maria gephardt mayer was here yeah. and when she won the nobel prize her son told me that the newspaper said la jolla housewife wins nobel prize <laughs> you see and i wonder you know what is your how do you uh, think of yourself are you a scientist are you a mother how, how do you picture yourself as a human being what 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 defines you to you I am what I am. I am a woman, mm -hmm. and I happen to like to be in the lab and to build great technology instruments, and I am most proud of my daughters because that, mm -hmm. I used to say, and I wrote it down, they are the best experiments I made. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the most incredible. successful experiment I ever made. Yeah. And I would never do anything differently, of course. Mm -hmm. You still feel guilty about the time you took away from them because the lab doesn't have time. Yeah, birthday I mean, parties. And the birthday missing. Mm -hmm. But they, they knew and they grew up stronger by knowing mm -hmm. that his mother has always something on her mind. She's right. thinking while she's cooking. Yeah. But to me, that's... And I want to instill in every young woman and student today approaching science that they can do the science. They have to do the science, but without forgetting that they're women. Mm -hmm. and caring mm -hmm. to find a guy or whoever mm -hmm. they want and be happy mm -hmm. in their in the rest of their uh, persona. Right. Make babies because, I mean, I think that every woman should have yeah, that experience. Yeah, superpower that women have. I mean, have. and I always <laughs> felt that I actually, what do I, how do I feel? I always felt 
stronger than my colleagues. I mm -hmm. was the first woman in the physics department yeah, of Columbia. That's right. So a lot you can imagine. I've been always <laughs> alone in these meetings, very, very much alone. Mm -hmm. So I'm vaccinated. I never mm -hmm. cared though, right? Because when I then got pregnant of Julia at Columbia, mm -hmm. uh, I mean the pr the people who had problems were more my colleagues mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. myself because they were not used to see. Right. And the bias is is large. I yeah. mean. What are you doing here? You should be home resting. And I say, no, but I'm fine. I'm yeah, feeling don't tell good. Me rest. I'm feeling good. They're but not that kind of doctor. I mean, I, I have no idea. But, you know, you have to keep going. And mm -hmm. these young women today have to know mm -hmm. that women, like the Vera Rubin and I'm sure Margaret, I mean, women can have a life yeah. and be a great scientist. Yeah, it doesn't really. have to exclude. One doesn't have to exclude the other. Yeah. And I think it would be a pity. In fact, what I find most... Sometimes sad is to see colleagues, smart women, who actually made the choice or made renounces and didn't decide at the right time mm. to fulfill other dreams in their life, and then eventually okay. they regret, and then it's too late. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I think we should encourage. Yeah, it's, I always say it's the, it's the hardest possible thing you could do. And I, I'm speaking as from a male perspective, but you know, I know it's a lot harder. But but being a parent is, you know, it is an experiment. And, and you hope that they don't, they're not null experiments and that, <laughs> that they yield good results. I have to say that I am, you know, you would enjoy coming over and helping with my twin one-year-olds <laughs> because they produce a lot of dark matter in diapers. Um, so you'd have firsthand experience, direct experience. Um, so there are a lot of, uh, uh, of, of ways we could, we could go with from here, but I do want to just maybe close out the discussion with one of the ways that you inspire physicists like me is as a leader. And it's something interesting that kind of relates back to Einstein. So, you know, Einstein was asked to be the first president of the new nation of Israel. And he was like, mm -hmm. why should I do that? And they're like, cause you're smart. Uh, but, but really there's a halo effect where people think, you know, someone can do one thing that it translates immediately over mm -hmm. into some other discipline, mm -hmm. which it doesn't, but you've managed to do two things that are totally different, right? To excel in your branch of physics and to also be a scientific manager and a leader mm -hmm. And there's, there's, I think it's, it's almost harder to do that. As I say, you know, as I said earlier, it's not like herding cats. At least cats basically stay on a planar surface. But you know, butterflies or herding neutrinos or dark matter wimps. Um, how do you, how did you do that? How do you do that? What the are same any way tricks you do or skills? It. And you know, we didn't. I didn't learn any management skill. No, we and don't. I think. Some people have it better than others. Mm -hmm. I mean, I thank my mother for that. Mm -hmm. It's that intuition that we have in understanding people. I'm reading people, right? I don't take very long to figure out when to talk to you in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And so I managed to keep together this collaboration, which grew from 20 people to almost 200 people. And I'm still managing that, but the way I do it is still my own way. Mm. Sometimes I go a bit off the... Mm -hmm. tangent but mm -hmm. typically i use my so-called intuition mm -hmm. this this connection that i have with people mm. i can read very easily and i motivating I, I, I definitely mm -hmm. i motivate mm -hmm. my students are my babies yeah. I, I mean i care a lot about every mm -hmm. member of this collaboration yeah and you see you see a lot of your colleagues usually Treating their students like someone who can you can see only once a week, maybe mm -hmm. once even a month. Mm -hmm. For me, that much, every that much? just kidding. My students I mean, out I there, know, I'm just I was saying, um, for me, it's everyday life. I see, it, and I want to know everything what they do. I'm mm -hmm. so in. It's true. I always am curious, but yeah. the reason why I'm curious: How are you doing? How is it going with your wife? Mm -hmm. How is your kid? To yeah. my post, it's because I know. First of all, it's it's probably selfish. Yeah, because somebody happy mm -hmm. works better. Yeah. So when I when I sense that something is wrong, which is a personal matter, mm -hmm. I try to help them solve it because I know that they otherwise there's an impasse. So mm -hmm. it's also a bit selfish, yeah, but okay. I do care about what they're doing with their life as well and try to help them. Yeah. And try to help them also become not just great scientists but also great human beings. Mhm. Mm and if that means also learning how to make a good espresso. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and how to cut cable ties. And cable well, ties, that's right. So that I'm the never... woman will not think of them as sloppy. Right. <laughs> I mean, that goes without saying. That's For right. me, it's important to 
Uh, and we will have a workshop on how to make the best lasagna. Oh, that well, I will sign I mean, up for that. that. I would, I'd like well, to participate in that experiment. I mean, how can you be a good physicist and can't. hope to get a great <laughs> woman if you don't even know how to cook a good meal for her? <laughs> Uh, very, very true. Um, so my final question is a question I ask everyone from Nobel laureates, Pulitzer Prize winners, uh, entrepreneurs, etc. cetera, who have uh, been so uh, gracious with their time as you have with yours to come on this podcast. And that is um, we focus here at the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination on this question of imagination, which is naturally connected to creativity. The unique human capacity for reason, I think, is is what sets us apart, what distinguishes us. Uh, but the question of, you know, can't pedagogically, can you, can you teach someone to be the next Elena Priel? I mean, can you teach somebody to do the kinds of things, the skill set, the meta skills that we need to be the successes in our field? Is that a teachable skill or is it, you have to be born with it? Obviously lasagna you can teach, but you know, uh, some of my you know cuisine, I, I wouldn't recommend on anybody, even if you were my <laughs> teacher. So, is it something? And as a physicist, can you teach someone to be a physicist? A lot of theoretical physicists say, you know, I've, I've interviewed have said, well, we tend to think of everyone in theoretical physics as Einstein, and so I can't be like Einstein, so I won't even try. But but we're experimentalists. We're dealing with the real, mm-hmm. hardcore, substantive life and and actually contact with nature, not. Only, and I'm not disparaging theorists. They're my some of them are my best friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but can you teach creativity? Can you teach imagination that allows you to be successful in our field of experimental astrophysics? No, no, no. Brian. You mm-hmm. cannot teach someone <laughs> to be creative, to be imaginative. That's really something that you have. But mm. you can help a lot. Whatever is the little bit that you have in someone, Mm -hmm. channel it in the right direction. But I have seen over and over with my student, my postdoc, you can make them better, but if they didn't have to begin with the curiosity, the creativity, Mm -hmm. they're never going to invent something in the lab. They're Mm -hmm. going to be more follower Mm -hmm. than leader in that sense, but not leader in terms of taking initiative and making something new Mm -hmm. out of nothing. I, at least my experience has been so far that it's hard to teach. Mm. That's not a skill. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's you can teach learn, them right. to be great experimentalists. I have turned the best theoretical mm-hmm. physics student into a good experimentalist. Interesting. But mm-hmm. usually I don't get from them that innovative thing that you get from someone who is really, as I say, a, a lab animal. Yeah. That's how I, <laughs> right. I have had a few lab animals right. in my life. I want, and I'm not as good as some of them. Mm-hmm. But you really see that that is something that these people just have it. Yeah. They just get better and better at it. But you can't beat that. You can't teach. There has that. to be something in there. But maybe I'm wrong. No, definitely. Mm-hmm. Well, Elena, it's been <laughs> such a pleasure having you on the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination's Into the Impossible podcast. I want to encourage folks to subscribe and like and review and rate on iTunes and elsewhere, wherever you get your podcasts, wherever you watch online, on YouTube and elsewhere. Um, Elena, anything you want to promote? You're going to be giving a colloquium here in, at UC San Diego in April, I believe. Uh, we can't wait to see that. We just had our public event. Um, you're around as uh, the rest of this quarter uh, as the uh, visiting Margaret Burbage professor. Anything you want to um, talk about that we didn't get a chance to cover on, on today's uh, podcast? I just wish here, like I do a bit at Columbia, but to a certain extent less, to encourage every student. I've been meeting with the undergraduate mm-hmm. of women in physics. Mm-hmm. I will meet with the graduate students in physics, women in physics. But every young man and woman who is in love with physics to come and see me on campus mm-hmm. while I'm here yeah. or talk to me because I think the future, of course, in, like in everything mm-hmm. else, is in these uh, young minds. And we ought to give them whatever we have learned because as I grow older, mm-hmm. <laughs> you realize you have a lot to tell, to, to share with the younger people, of course. But if you don't have a chance to talk, you will never be able to pass the message. That's right. So I'm here, so they should no. come and well, see we're me. very honored and uh, grateful for you spending your time here. But thank uh, you. It's been and, a pleasure uh, to be with you. We can't wait to find more discoveries uh, together. Let's thank hope you. so. Thank you. Bye. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one.